Hey everyone, we're glad to be kicking off November with you all here online and believe we have some incredible moments in front of us this morning. It's the beginning of the month, so be sure you have communion supplies ready for later in the service as we get started today. And while we may be starting a new month, today is our last message out of living with the end in mind. I trust we're all walking away with a greater understanding of what God has in store and how we can live well toward his purposes as we wait for those times to unfold. I remember years ago, one of my friends and I were talking about the end times and he asked me if I was afraid of what was to come. And I just responded that there are some uncertainties for sure. And I definitely have some questions, but I also have Jesus and he's going to see his people through. I want you to have that hope that whatever questions, whatever uncertainties you may have about the end times or these times, that you rest in Jesus with a confident hope in his finished work and what it means for all those who have trusted in him. He hasn't, and he's not going to abandon his people. Let's pray before we head over. Father, thank you for Jesus and his resurrected life. Thank you that we have hope because of him, because of what you've done, because of this beautiful gospel that you've, you've offered, to, offered to us. Lord, thank you that we have a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, that in these times and in the end times and whatever else we encounter, Lord, that we can have a confident hope because you are a good, faithful father. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's head over for now, and then I will see you all in just a bit. Good morning, Christ Chapel. Whether you're joining us in the sanctuary or online, welcome. We're so glad you're here on this beautiful Sunday. We have a great hour of worship ahead of us. But first, we'd love to get to know you a little better. So whether you've been coming to Christ Chapel for a very long time or you're a guest with us, we'd love to have you fill out this Connect card. It's in the seat back in front of you. Just fill out as much information as you're comfortable with. This is just a great way for us to connect with you and help you get connected at Christ Chapel. There's so many things going on here. We want to help you get involved. Also, inside that connect connect card is a place for prayer requests. So please let us know your praises. Maybe God's done some really great things in your life this week. And also share with us your prayer requests. We are a praying church. We'd love to come alongside with you and lift you up in prayer. So let us know those and you can take it out to the great room and drop it in the offering box and we'll get it. Ladies, it's that time of year. Christmas is coming up, and we have our annual Christmas brunch on December 3rd. That's a Saturday from 10 to 12, 12 at the Will Rogers Coliseum. If you've never been, you need to come. It's amazing. There's beautifully decorated tables, but more importantly, you'll hear a message about the birth of Jesus Christ, his love for you, why he came to to earth and the gospel will be shared. So we ask that you bring your neighbors, your friends who've never heard the gospel to come. Come to the Christmas brunch. Tickets go on sale today. They're out in the great room. You can also sign up to decorate a table. You can sign up online. We have QR codes this year where you can sign up to decorate a table or purchase purchase a ticket, and we have some paper tickets. So we have anything you need out there at the uh, women's kiosk. So head out there after the service. We love to start our service by saying hello to one another, so let's do that now. Would you please stand up and say good morning to someone around you? together.
of all, and our only hope is found in him. Let's sing of that together. Amen. You may be seated. Let's continue to worship through our offertory time. I am reminded of Deuteronomy 16, 17 that says, Every man shall give as he's able according to the blessing of the Lord your God that he has given you. What an opportunity we have at this moment to, ab- to be able to give back to the Lord what is already his, but have an opportunity that through our giving, the love of God can continue, become a tangible reality in this present world. On the screen, you'll see ways to give. We are thankful that you are here. Let us go before the Lord in prayer. Father, we uh, thank you that we are able to give back to you from all that you give to us, Lord. And we know that everything we have is yours. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for this church. Thank you.
for the things that we are doing, the lives that you are touching here and around the world. We pray this in your name. Amen.
hello everyone. It is great to be back with you and to continue in this series on the Gospel of Matthew. So do turn there to Matthew chapter uh, 25. Matthew 25, we're going to be looking at verses 31 through to 46. If you don't have a copy of the Scriptures with you, there is a pew Bible around you, and you can turn to page 831, 831. Now today we're going to finish off on what's been discussed as the Olivet Discourse, the Olivet Discourse. And it's, it's, like, a, it's like a sermon. It's a little mini lecture uh, uh, that Jesus gives to some of His disciples there on the, on the side of a mountain that overlooks uh, Jerusalem. And of course, He wanted it recorded for, for us, for the church. That's why Matthew includes it in a book that's written for us. The, uh, the Olivet Discourse is there, and it concerns what's going to happen on down history's timeline. You know that if you've been with us for the last few weeks, and uh, it, it's, it's Jesus' instructions to the disciples in, in light of His rejection, in light of the fact that that generation rejected that visitation, in light of the fact that they rejected Him as King, they rejected Him as, as offering them a kingdom and, and life in it. So we're studying that seven-year period that's still to come. And it's presented for you beautifully in this chart that you'll see in the sermon notes as well as on the screen. It's, it, it's very simple. It's very helpful. You know, some end times charts are so complicated that you can't figure out which way is up and which way is down. And so Pastor Cody has done a magnificent job. He's done a lot of heavy lifting to help you see very simply and very accurately the events of that seven-year period that's coming. Uh, today's passage just deals with one little aspect of the second coming of Christ. There, there are several things going on there. Matthew 25, 31 to 46 doesn't uh, record all of the activities there, but it certainly focuses on, on one very important aspect of it as a warning, a warning for us even today, a new warning that is very, very clear and, uh, and clear warnings are important. This week on Monday, I was heading out the house, and my wife handed me a 20% off coupon to the local hairdressers. <laughs> Say no more. <laughs> very, very clear. Very, very clear warning. Don't you come back here without that haircut. <laughs> I got it. Warnings of what's going to happen are, are an opportunity to respond to do something about it before it happens. And that's something I'm not very good at usually. Uh, I was driving down the road not too long ago, and I was minding my own business, and suddenly this light lit up on, on my dashboard. And I thought, what I think normal people do is, huh. <laughs> that's interesting. And I just went about my busy day. But the rascal came back for the next few days, and eventually it was accompanied by a beeping sound, <laughs> as if to be giving me some attitude. And so I did what I think most normal people do. I give the car a piece of my mind. <laughs> yeah, I, thank you for your suggestion. I'm busy, you know, I have stuff to do today. I don't, I don't sit around all day in parking lots with my pals. I have things to do. Then over the next few weeks, the light came on, the beep sounded, and would you believe it, I got an email on my phone. <laughs> and a message popped up on the dashboard that said, change oil soon. And again, I thought, it's impressive. It speaks English. <laughs> so you've got to understand, my cars up until this point have been just one generation up from Fred Flintstone's car. <laughs> and, and they never spoke to me. They never sort of sent me little messages. And here we have one. So I thought, well, that's impressive. A little preachy, but... <laughs> Impressive nonetheless, just relax. You'll get a drink of oil soon enough. <laughs> and then the morning arrived when the light came on and the sound rung 
and I got the email on my phone and the message on the dashboard, change oil, soon emerged, but with a little addition, it said 2%. Change oil soon, 2%. Now, I'm a smart guy. I knew it wasn't referring to, you know, it's good to have 2% in your milk. It was to do with the oil level in my car, that it shouldn't be at 2%, and so panic kicked in. I kid you not, I was driving trying to figure out if I could get to a mechanics, worried that this car was just going to blow up. Well, the moral of the story for me was warnings from the car maker are for my benefit, not for my inconvenience. Warnings are sounded to be heard and to be heeded. I was a fool to continually ignore all the different warnings that the car was sending my way to do something about what was a likely future if I ignored it. An opportunity I had to respond in time. And that, that's what's going on in the Olivet Discourse. The Olivet Discourse is one big massive warning. In fact, in chapter 24, Jesus told his disciples, See, I have told you these things ahead of time. Ahead of time, before they happen, so that you will be ready. Our passage this morning presents a remarkable warning, a gracious warning of coming judgment so that we do something about it today, so that we don't ignore it, so that we don't go off into our Sunday just dreaming about nachos and cheese for lunch and a little bit of football. So let me walk you through what's here and hopefully leave you with a little thought to take into your week to respond to Jesus' warning in Matthew 25. We start really with a description of his second coming that's in your chart, but that speaks of his visitation, and it's a just visitation. One of the words that's used in the Scriptures to speak about God's interventions in planet, on planet Earth is that God visits Earth, that, that there are multiple visitations of God. And, and this visitation of God is going to be Jesus Christ personally returning to planet Earth. Look at verse 31 with me. Three things, I believe, are highlighted there. When the Son of Man comes, when He returns to planet Earth, in His glory. That's number one. He's coming in His glory. And number two, with all the angels with Him. And number three, He will sit on His glorious throne. This next visit is going to be a full display of the greatness of Jesus Christ with an entourage of millions upon millions of angelic beings in order to not sit on the mountainside with a few, you know, disciples who are all feeling dejected, but to enter into that city that has rejected Him, and to sit on that throne, and to judge, and to rule. See, that's very different than His first visitation to planet Earth. It was filled with, with humility. It was sort of a backdoor entrance to an insignificant little couple in an insignificant little town, in an insignificant little country, really, on the grand scheme of things, drips with humility. He was met by a few bleeding sheep and smelly shepherds. That's it. His glory was veiled intentionally. It was a humble arrival to invite us to follow Him in His way out of faith and out of devotion and out of love for Him, not because we're intimidated by who He really is. Jesus isn't looking for some sort of forced submission, but a relationship with those beings that have been created in His likeness. So that second coming is not going to be like His first coming. In fact, other portions of Scripture help us get into that verse 31 with a little bit more detail. You don't need to turn there, but let me read for you Revelation 19, where we get a little bit more of, a, of what's happening here. Listen up, verse 11 in Revelation 19, it says this, Then I saw heaven opened, is the Apostle John speaking, and behold, a white horse the one sitting on it was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, 
meaning he burns through to see everything accurately. And on his head are, are many diadems, meaning he's filled with authority. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself, and he is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses, and from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty, and on his robe and on his thigh he, was, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Jesus is returning like that not as a redeemer to offer salvation to those who have rejected him, but as the triumphant warrior king who's robed in glory and he's surrounded by the armies of angels in order to bring justice and to rule on his rightful throne among humanity for eternity. So as you will understand, Matthew 25 verse 31 is quite the verse. I'd, I'd love you to sit in that a few days, maybe even tremble a little bit, not, not in fear, but in awe that Jesus Christ is not some sort of pushover, and Jesus Christ is not just your buddy, but that Jesus Christ is God, and He's the triumphant warrior king who's going to return and bring justice. Now, if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, personally, then maybe you should sit in that verse with not all, but a little bit of fear in light of what comes next. So, this visitation is going to be a just visitation. He arrives as he should arrive, but among other things, what it's going to include is a just separation, a proper, a fair, a right sifting between those who are his and those who are not his, who are alive at that time. Look at verses uh, 32 and 33 with me. Before him, that's before Jesus Christ, will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. So all people alive at that time from every nation under the sun, that's, that's Germans, that's the Spanish, that's the French, that's the Americans, that's the Texans, that's the Northern Irish, all will come before. <laughs> yeah, you like that. All will come before the Lord Jesus Christ. See, all humans look alike to us. But on that day, not all humans are going to look alike through the fiery eyes of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, some are going to look like sheep, and some are going to look like goats, as He's going to separate the goats from the sheep. And, and, and that really speaks of those who rejected Him on the left, the goats, and those who received Him on the right, the sheep. So that analogy of, of, of a shepherd reemerges in Scriptures. It, it's, it, it sort of pops in and out all the way through the Scriptures. Back in the ancient world, certainly in that part of the world, sheep and goats kind of looked the same. It's hard for me as an Irishman to understand that because, you see, sheep look a very distinct little white fluffy thing in my part of the world, but, but not in that part of the world. Sheep and goats kind of look the same, but not to Jesus Christ. Every human being alive at that time is either a sheep or, or, or a goat, and, and those, those aren't flattering animals. But think about it. We humans haven't been flattering beings for all of human history. This is very appropriate. This sifting or separation, as I said, is just. It is, it is Jesus' right to, to separate and sift according to his own criterion. And we understand that principle in life, 
right? I mean, I, I don't let anybody just live in my house. You've got to be a Murphy. You've got to be about this height and sort of becoming this height. And once you maybe become this height, then it's time to move out, right? <laughs> no, there's a dog, as you well know, that snuck in there. I don't know how that happened. But, but in regular life, you would understand that I, as the head of household, have the right to sift who lives in here and who doesn't live in here according to my criterion. I saw this model for right in front of my eyes this week, Halloween night, by my little Halloween candy warriors, my boys as they go out into the streets. And yes, I don't like all the stuff that goes on in Halloween either, all the witches and all that nonsense. Don't send me nasty emails. I don't agree with all of that. But candy is genius. <laughs> like it, it stocks up our larder for a few months. It's a genius idea. And so my little Halloween candy warriors make their way back home and they throw all the candy on the table, and they begin to separate. <laughs> they begin to sift. And the sifting occurs according to their criteria, which is, it's fair. What I don't like goes on the left. What I do like goes on the right. And so you have Hershey bars over here with Tootsie Rolls. Uh, you don't like that, you see, you're from here. And then you've got things like Twix bars over here on the right. That's the good stuff. And, and the criteria is essentially their taste buds. And they have a right to reject what they don't like and a right to accept what they do like. My point is that we're okay in regular life with sifting and separating. None of us would, would object to what my, my boys do. In fact, none of us would think that, that, that the Hershey bar should speak up and say, that's not fair. That's not the way it should be. As I understand the world, you should pick me. No. Hershey bars and Trix bars don't get a say on the criteria for evaluating what goes right and what goes left on Halloween night in our household. On that day, Jesus is going to sift. And that sifting is going to be just, proper, right. According to criteria that he has set, whether you like it or not. And so we move on to that evaluation, and that's what comes next, a just evaluation, a just assessment, a fair and proper and right assessment that's set by God, not by us, as to who goes right and who goes left. Verses 34 and on really are a series of two dialogues that, that Jesus as king has with the sheep and then Jesus as king has with the goats. Look, look at verse 34 with me. Then the king will say to those on his right, that's the sheep, come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom that was prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Verse 35, here's why, for I was hungry and you gave me food, and I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Now, this causes a little bit of confusion among the sheep. Look at verses 37 to 39. Then the righteous, who's the sheep, will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry? and feed you, or thirsty, and give you drink? And when did we see you as a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick, or in prison, and visit you? Now, their confusion is understandable, because Jesus won't be around physically on planet earth those seven years. They, they won't physically see him, just like we don't physically see him today. But they did feed the hungry, and they did clothe the naked, and they give, did give something to drink to those who were thirsty, and they, they did welcome strangers and visit the sick and visit the imprisoned. They did do all those beautiful acts of compassion toward those in need around them. They're not saying, but we didn't do any of that. They're saying, we didn't know that we did that to you. 
But you see, Jesus sees better than you and I see. Jesus sees differently. Jesus sees more fully. Those fiery eyes see invasively beyond the external acts and into the motivations and then dispositions of the heart. So look what he says in verse 40. And the king will answer them, truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Here's what he's saying, and we get a little bit of help concerning who these brothers are in the book of Revelation. It seems that in that time when humanity is going through affliction that has never been seen before, and the church has been raptured, believers in the Lord Jesus Christ are gone, that some Jewish people are going to see that Jesus was their Christ. And they're going to turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, and they're going to proclaim the gospel of the message of the kingdom throughout those seven years. And and others are going to come to Christ. But, But those servants of the Lord are going to be persecuted. Life's going to be very hard for them because they're not going to bow the knee to the beast, and so they're going to endure persecution, hunger, right? They're going to be imprisoned. Well, it seems that these Gentiles who do believe the gospel that's preached through them live out their faith in the world toward them with a heart of compassion. They see a need, and because Jesus Christ reigns in their hearts, they respond. You didn't think you were doing it to me, Jesus says, but I saw that it was for me. All of that was for me. Their works of compassion were seen by Jesus as tangible expressions of deeply rooted inner faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. What Jesus is saying is, I take very personally how those who believe in me treat those around them. I take it personally. And like Pastor Cody said last week, what we have here is really the same principle that faith that saves serves Faith that saves is is faith that serves. And Jesus is seeing their acts as an expression of their commitment to him through those who are around them. But then Jesus turns his attention toward those on his left, the goats. Look at verses 41 to 45. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me. You cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. And this also causes confusion amongst the goats. Look at verse 44. Then they will also answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison? and did not minister to you. We didn't see you on planet earth. Verse 45, then he will answer them saying, truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. The lack of expression of compassion toward Even the least of God's messengers during that era was proof that they were not part of God's people. No compassion, it seems to me, is a symptom of no conversion. No compassion is a symptom of no conversion. No interest in God's work, no interest in God's word, no interest in God's workers is also a tangible expression that Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ does not reside in the inner crevices of your heart, is what Jesus is saying. Now, there's lots of details in there that we can't go into. The, The point really generally is this, that we have a clear admission criterion by Jesus to enter into the kingdom of God that puts you on the right as a sheep or that puts you on the left as a goat. But that criterion isn't new. That's been the same all the way through human history. That's all over the Scriptures. 
not just in the tribulation period. And it's not a criterion that's unfair and that's wrong. Uh, it's not a criterion that has to be approved by me. For goodness sake, Hershey's chocolate bar don't get to dictate to my boys whether they should be liked or not. Whether they should be put on the right, not on the left. God's not looking for our opinion on his admission criterion, but here's the thing. God wants us on the right. God wants us in the kingdom of God. God wants us with him. God wants you to be his sheep. And so he's acted to activate that. We call it the gospel, and the criterion is simple. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. In fact, I think Ephesians 2, 8, and 8 to 10, some of my favorite verses in, in the entire Bible, make it very, very clear. It's a classic text. You don't need to go there, but listen up. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This salvation is not your doing. It is a gift of God. It's not a result of works so that no one may boast but, but verse 10 is important because those who have received his salvation by grace through faith, look what verse 10 says. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared in advance so that we walk in them. This isn't faith in Jesus plus good works and good living. This is only faith in Jesus, but those who have faith in Jesus genuinely produce works of faith. And here in Matthew 25, we're getting a glimpse of the fact that Jesus Christ as judge and ruler over humanity sees faith through the type of works that they're engaged in, works of compassion. Now, the Reformers, since the 1500s, have been shouting about this. <laughs> they, they've been saying, hey, remember, you're saved by faith alone in Christ alone, but faith alone in Christ alone never comes alone. It always oozes out into works of faith, works of love to those around you. It's why Jesus says in the greatest commandment is that you love the Lord your God with all that is your being and your neighbor as yourself. They go hand in hand. Faith that saves is, is faith that serves. Now, that just evaluation that, that Jesus just used as a criterion for who goes into the right and who goes into the left also speaks of destinies, a just destination that awaits the sheep and that awaits the ghosts. It's a fair and it's a proper and it's a right location for those who do not trust God and those who do trust God. Look at verse 46. And these, that is the goats, will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. There's just two destinations according to Jesus. Whether you like it or not, that's his opinion. Whether you think it's fair or not is irrelevant. According to Jesus Christ, there's just two destinations for humankind. Eternal life in pure, unimaginable bliss for sheep in the kingdom of God, in a kingdom that was prepared from before the foundation of the earth, or eternal separation from God, eternal punishment for the goats that reject Him. Now, those are some tough words, but they're true. And they're a warning to evoke a response so that you avert the disaster that will come when it's no longer a warning but a reality. Now, hopefully, you've picked up on the fact that so far, all I've said for you to fill out is that it's just, 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 just. And it's not that I'm concerned about your spelling. It's because that's who God is. He is just. And He will judge justly because He sees accurately. And so, in light of that, what should we do? How should we live with the end in mind? This is very, very important, and if you're tracking closely with this series that we've been on 
in the Olivet Discourse, you'll have picked up on the fact that if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're not going to be in that time period. You're going to be in that time period only if today you're not a Christian, and if today the rapture comes, and if you survive to the end of those seven years, which is maybe not that likely in light of how brutal that stage in human history is going to be. But but the same sifting occurs today as it relates to those who are part of the church, the body of Christ, and those who are not. It's a sifting that's based on those same criterion, those who have faith and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and those who don't. So it's just a question of what judgment you're going to be a part of. And if you look at the chart closely, there's a, there's a judgment that's going to come a thousand years after the one here in, in the second coming of Christ. We call it the great white throne judgment. God is just. God is fair. And he's giving opportunities for people to enter into his kingdom his way as he has every right to do or face the alternative as he has every right to do. So with that all said, what, what do we do? How do I want you to enter into your week? It's very, very simple. I mean, I couldn't have said it in any other way. Maybe I could have said it in one other way, but here's what I have for you. Don't be a goat when you can be God's sheep. Why would you be a goat when you can be God's sheep? I mean, I could have said it this way. Don't be on the left when you can be on the right. But I fear that this week, <laughs> that, no, <laughs> that's not what Jesus is saying here. That's not what Jesus is saying here. If you, if you are God's sheep today, it's a metaphor that still is relevant to those outside of those living in that tribulation period to today. If you're a part of God's sheep today, part of the people of God, then why, why, why don't you show him your gratitude? Why don't you dial up your compassion for perhaps the neighbor beside you who's not voting in the same direction as you are? So that you can show him a better way, a, a life under the rule of Jesus Christ so that your tone doesn't get into the way of their eternal destiny because they can't see Jesus except through you. If you're a sheep, dial up the compassion for those around you. You know, my Halloween candy warriors taught me, again, a very important lesson this week, that you express your gratitude. They did it through what I love every sort of Halloween week, which is my Halloween candy warriors pay Halloween candy dad tax. <laughs> and I take from the right, from the, from the sheepfold, I take the Twixes. I leave the Tootsie Rolls and all that nonsense to, to eternal perdition. <laughs> and of course, I enforce the appropriate hike due to inflation rates these days. So it's a, it's, a higher, it's a higher tax. But my point is they give gratefully. They give willingly. They give generously. Why? Because they're grateful. They're very grateful. And if you're grateful to Jesus Christ for what he has done in your life, it comes out of you. It oozes out of you. But this warning is primarily for you if you're a goat. And I hope there's no goats listening because you're all sheep, but there, there probably are some goats here. And just to be clear, if you're a goat, this doesn't mean the greatest of all time, right? You're not the greatest of all time. Not, not here, not in this context. In this context, in light of Jesus' warning, it potentially is you're the goofiest of all time if you ignore the warning. This has been in the Scriptures for 2,000 years. It's a warning that's been repeated throughout the centuries, and some have ignored it, and I hope it's not you. If you ignore Jesus' invitation to life with him through faith in what he has done, you're a goat and you remain a goat. 
His admission criteria remains the same. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. In a few moments, we're going to participate in communion, which, which essentially is a testimony that demonstrates that God is just. He will punish sin, but He took sin on Himself. Jesus Christ took on God's just judgment for sin, for your sin, on the cross so that you would receive eternal life His way, according to His criteria. So you would enter into eternal life and not skew off into eternal punishment. In fact, verse 41, where we read that it says, depart, you cursed, for you're the goats. I didn't know you. Go to the place that's been prepared, not for you. It was prepared for the devil and his angels. God doesn't want you there. God didn't make that destination for you. But that's where you're going to go if you don't receive through faith, the salvation that he wants to give in the person of Jesus Christ alone. Goats, the manufacturer of life, warns you this morning on, on, on this morning's dashboard with a very, very clear message, change your goat status soon. Leave the, the nachos and the cheese and the football until you get right with God. Don't remain a goat when you can become part of God's sheep. Father, we thank you for how clear your word is. And Lord, it's tough preaching in one sense, but it honors you, and that's what I want to do, and that's what your people want and deserve. Lord, I pray that if there are people here who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ personally, that you would pursue them this week, that you'd soften their hearts, that they would receive your salvation in Christ alone through faith, and that they would reach out to some of us, to the church, to their neighbors, to whoever brought them, so that they can get the help that they need to continue to be the people that you want them to be, so they can join the sheep and enter into eternal life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let us take some time this morning and let us come to the Lord's table together. We've heard a great message. Let us remember God's process, having the end in mind, which is the series that we're current at the moment, should also remind us of an important beginning that Jesus, according to Romans 5.8, began a good work in us while we were yet sinners. It is through Christ that he allowed us to have that relationship with God by dying on the cross for our sins. He made a way for us, for our sins to be forgiven and for us to have peace with God. Scripture also lets us know that three days, he died and rose three days from the grave, giving us eternal hope. Those are things that we should ponder. Those are things that we should reflect on, on the person and work of Christ in us. But before we even proceed into that area, let us take a moment and pause. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 27 and 28, shares with all of us and says not to participate in the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. So let us consider, and at this moment, remember where our worthiness comes from. One, there's nothing that we have done that allows us to proceed before the Lord's table. He's done it all for us. There's not going to be a place where we can say we are able to in our own strength, in our own uh, ways before the, for the Lord. We lack the mistakes, therefore we can be before God. In fact, Romans 3.23, as you all know, says clearly we all have sinned 
and fallen short of God's glory. In fact, Job, Apostle Paul was not the first one. Job 14.4 talks about this. He mentions there in the book of Job, who can make clean out of the unclean? No one. Yet I want to challenge you today, those who are watching, those that are here, to be still for a minute, to meditate and marvel at the very next verses there in Romans 3, 24 and 25. And these will come up on the screen. The Bible says, and we are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. These two verses are going to be up on the screen for a moment to give us time to examine ourselves before we partake in communion. Let us take a moment and do one of two things. For some of y'all, and I know that this is what Pastor Murphy just shared, you just probably need to sit there and think about the goodness of the Lord, the grace that we have through Jesus Christ, that gift that he's given us, and be thankful. Or maybe you are that person sitting there this morning, wandering, pondering the deep question in life. Have you received this free gift through Jesus Christ? Or are you still trying to earn it? Are you trying to work your way to a place where you feel and say, I've strained everything in my life to be able to partake in the Lord's table? Maybe this morning, instead of partaking in communion, you need to sit before the Heavenly Father who by grace is calling you into an eternal and eternal relationship through his son. If this is you this morning, I pray today that you place your trust in Christ and give us as a church an opportunity to walk alongside you, to encourage you in this life-changing aspect that God is desiring to initiate in your life. So before we partake in the elements, I want you to focus and read these verses, give you some time to examine yourself, and then we will continue with the rest of the elements. As we take the elements this morning, remember that on the night that the Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. 
And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take and eat together. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us take it together. Let us pray. Lord, we are grateful that you are at work in our lives and that you've been at work in our lives even before we even knew we needed you. We remember what Jesus has done for us and it gives us hope and courage to trust you to the very end. As you continue the work, You first began in us. We love you, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
God is going to see his people through. And I'm so grateful to have hope for now and for then. I pray the same is true for you. If we can pray with you before you go today, go ahead and click request prayer and someone from our team will join with you one-on-one. Praying with you is a huge reason we're here as hosts. So don't hesitate to share how we can pray for you today and throughout this next week. Next Sunday, we'll head into a new portion of our time in Matthew and look forward to another Sunday together at our campuses and here online as we keep looking at the heart and ministry of Jesus and how it affects our here and now. I hope you have a great week and we'll see you then.